Welcome to Latin 3. This is Dr. Lowe, and since I assume that most of you spent your summers uh, pretty much Latin free, I want to ease us back into, into uh, translating Latin, specifically at uh, getting comfortable with the, uh, with the forms, the grammar, and the vocabulary we'll be um, uh, dealing with this year in a rather gentle way. Overall, my goal is to schematize and translate the first six lines of our text, the so-called Millionaire's Dinner Party. But before we get started, I want to begin with a little bit of background. The book we'll be reading this year is an adaptation of the so-called Cana Trimalchionis, the Dinner of, uh, of Trimalchio, uh, written by a man named Petronius. We'll be coming back to the author, to Petronius, his life and his rather dramatic death under Nero in the days ahead. Um, but today I want to simply give you a little bit of background to the first chapter of the book we'll be reading. As you probably have noticed, or, you're, or you will notice soon, the text we have begins in medias rex, a race, in the, in the middle of things. And that's not at all surprising. For the, the Cana Trimalchionis, the Millionaire's Dinner Party, is only one incident from a very long novel called the Satyricon, of which only fragments survive. These fragments, probably from books 14, 15, and 16 of, of Petronius's Satyricon, fill 134 pages in translation in the Penguin Classics. That's a lot of pages, and obviously... If a fragment is 134 pages uh, long, the complete work was, was undoubtedly much longer, potentially ten times as long. And the plot of this huge book centers on the adventures of a narrator named Encopius. He's a young man, probably in his late teens or early 20s, and he's a drifter who wanders from place to place with no visible means of support. He's continually involved in disreputable ex escapades, and he's a real anti-hero in the sense that uh, he doesn't really evoke our admiration. He's not the kind of, of, of young man you look at and say, boy, I hope I can grow up and be like that. But he certainly is likable. He elicits minimally a lot of sympathy and very frequently a lot of laughter. As far as we can tell from the text, because it is a fragmentary uh, 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 a text, as far as we can tell, though, Encolpius's wanderings began in the French town, the modern French town of Marseille, ancient Massilia, and he was exiled from there. From there, he sails to Italy, and probably after a visit to Rome, he winds up at the Bay of Naples. And it's here at the Bay of Naples that the surviving portion of our book, uh, The Millionaire's Dinner Party, begins. It's set in a town called Putioli, a popular and fashionable seaside resort and a really quite important uh, commercial center uh, in, the, in the early empire. While he's in Putioli, Encopius meets another young man named Ascyltos. And this guy is, all, is a student, and he share, the two of them wind up sharing sharing lodgings together. In the first surviving fragment, which we're going to be reading over the next several days, uh, the two have been attending a lecture on rhetoric, and we find um, Encolpius kind of fulminating against the inadequacies of modern education. He's kind of jumping up and down about how worthless the modern approach, modern meaning in, in this case the modern Roman approach to education is. And his professor, a man named Agamemnon, overhears this tirade, and he's impressed by its eloquence. And, and Agamemnon, the professor, who's been so impressed by Encolpius's uh, um, blast at modern education, preserve, uh, procures for the two of them, Encolpius and Ascyltos, an invitation to dinner with the millionaire Trimalchio. They've had plenty of misadventures, so they, they have lots of problems hanging over them, but that's where we're, we're beginning. These two, two young men, along with a third uh, 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 young man who is also involved in this, named Giton, have been invited to dinner at Trimalchio's house. With that, let's begin our schematization and translation. 
The speaker of the first line is Encolpius, who says, Itaque maisti deliberabamus de malis quae nobis eminebant, cum servus agamemnonus intravit, et quid inquit non escitus? Hodie ad canam invitati estus atrum alcioni, lautissimo homine, venite igitur, nolite morari. Encolpius goes on to say, Malorum igitur obliviscimur, et caleriter vestimenta induimus, et gitona, qui libent, libentissime servi officium agit, iubemus ad balnea nosequi. Such is the Latin. Now let's schematize and then ultimately translate those five and a half or six lines. We begin with the conjunction itaque. And so, our next word is maisti, maistus a um, an adjective, a 212 adjective that means sad. We're not exactly sure what case maisti is at this point. We see the I ending, and as a 212 adjective, recognize that it could be nominative plural. Uh, or uh, genitive singular of the second declension, we'll take a bet at this point that it's nominative plural given its early appearance in the sentence. And maistus a um means sad. So, and so, sad, deliberabamus, right away we get our verb. We were, and it's obvious what this word, we were deliberating, we were thinking, we were considering. So we were thinking... Deliberabamus, an imperfect. De malis, about the evils, here probably better translated, about the problems. And now we encounter one of the key constructions we'll be dealing with in this chapter, a relative clause. What kind of, of, of problems were we dealing with? De malis quae nobis iminebant. The problems followed by a relative pronoun in the nominative, quae, which, imineo, imenebant, from the verb imineo, which means threaten or hangover, which were threatening, and then nobis, a dative. That's a surprise. Literally, this says, which were threatening us. Remember that in Latin, you mineo, you threaten someone or something in the dative case. So, to translate the full sentence, and so, sad, we were deliberating, we were thinking, de malis, about the problems, quae nobis imenebant, which were hanging over us. Cum. Now we get to something a little bit odd as well. Cum. We've learned in first-year Latin that cum is typically is a preposition that means with and is followed by the ablative. But here we continue reading, cum servus agamemnonus, no ablative in sight. What's going on with cum? Here we have to remember that cum, when not followed by the ablative, means when. So, and so sad, we were thinking about the problems which were threatening us when servus agamemnonus, a slave, nominative, Agamemnonus, a third declension genitive, a slave of Agamemnon, what did he do? He introed, which obviously means he entered, and note that this word said, inquit, does not immediately follow the et. It's embedded in the, in the, in the phrase that he spoke. It's called a post-positive. It comes second in its clause or in its sentence. He entered and said, Quid? What? And this, is, uh, this quid here is used much in the way that we would say, What? in English, meaning, What's going on? Or, What are you doing? So, slave of Agamemnon in Travit entered and inquit quid and said, What? Non escitus. Note the direct question. None in, in, uh, introducing a question, expecting the answer yes. Don't you know? Of course, and he's expecting the answer. Of course you know. Hodie, today, 
in vitati estus, you have been invited. Note, and we'll go over this in class tomorrow, the formation of a second person plural perfect passive indicative. You have been invited. Where have you been invited? Ad canam, to dinner. And who did the inviting? Ad tremolchione, by tremolchio. Then a very funny, funny phrase, a lautissimo homine. Obviously, the grammar of that is not particularly complicated. It's simply in a positive, in agreement with tremolchione in the ablative singular. The funny thing is the word lautissimo. You've been invited to dinner by tremolchio, a lautissimo, a most elegant man. This is, this is the um, uh, superlative of the adjective lautus, which technically comes from the Latin verb lavo, which means to wash. He's the most washed man. Note how the idea of, el of elegance and cleanliness are rather linked in the Latin language. So he's a most elegant man. Then we get this direct command, venite igitur. Second person plural imperative, come, therefore. And then we have a, a, a direct prohibition, nolite morare, don't, nolite morare. And moror, morare, moratus, uh, sum, a deponent verb, uh, a verb that has laid aside its active forms, and while passive in form is now active in meaning, so what he is telling them is, come therefore, nolite morare, don't delay. So far, so good. Gets only slightly more complex as we move ahead. Malorum igitur obliscimur. Obliviscor. Another deponent verb, its principal parts. Obliviscor, oblivisci, oblitusum, which means to forget. So this, uh, first person plural, uh, present active uh, indicative, present deponent indicative. We obliviscor, from which we get oblivion, we therefore forget. And we expect an accusative direct object, but we don't get it. Instead, we get a direct object in the genitive case. And this is an important point to remember. That in Latin, verbs of remembering and forgetting, verbs like obliviscor, which means I forget, and memini, which means I remember, take genitive objects. We saw the uh, 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 a dative used as a direct object of imineo in, in the in the first in the very first sentence we encountered that these were evils or problems which were threatening nobis us. Now we get. Obliviscimur malorum. Now we are forgetful of the e of our problems. Et caleriter, an adverb. And quickly, what do we do? We in duo, we put on our vestimenta, obviously our clothes. Now in the next phrase, we see something else that's a little bit funny. Gitona. It might be easy to think that this is a first declension noun ending in a, so obviously a, uh, a, a nominative. Remember, though, this is a guy. His name, and it's a Greek name, is Giton. It will decline in the third declension, Giton, Gitonis, Gitoni, but it will have, in place of a Latin ending, where we might expect to see in the accusative gitonem. Because it's a Greek name, it will take a so-called Greek accusative ending. Greek accusative singulars in the third declension do end in a. So this is an accusative singular. And so what? So this is not the subject of the next clause. Rather, it's the object. So very quickly, we put on our clothes, and what did we do? Eubemus. We ordered Gitona. We ordered Giton, who, very willingly, another another adverb, this time in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, superlative degree, 
who very willingly played the role, the officium, performed the duty of a slave, a genitive, we ordered Giton sequi, an infinitive from, from, from another deponent verb, sequor, to follow, to follow whom? To follow us to the baths. So that is essentially how this sentence, this paragraph is structured. To translate the whole thing again, itaque maisti, and so sad, deliberabamus, we were, cons- we were deliberating, we were thinking, de malis, about the problems, quae nobis imenebant, which hung over us, which threatened us. Cum servus agamemnonus intravit, when the slave of Agamemnon entered, et quid inquit, and said, what? Non escitus, don't you know? Hodie ad canam invitati estis a tremolcione. Today you've been invited to dinner by Tremolchio, a lautissimo homine, a most elegant man. Venite igitur. Come on then, come therefore. Nolite morari. Don't delay. Malorum igitur obliviscimur. Therefore, obliviscimur, we forget malorum, our problems, et celeriter, and quickly, induimus our vestimenta. We quickly put on our clothes. Et Gitona, and Giton, qui libentissime servi officium aget, who most willingly performed the duty of a slave, Ubemus ad balnean nos sequi. We ordered him to follow us to the baths. I hope that makes sense. Note the key points that have arisen in this, in this, um, uh, paragraph, all of which we'll be going over in much more detail in class tomorrow. First of all, we have noticed, um, I hope, uh, some non-accusative objects for certain verbs. We note that imineo takes a dative direct object in the line one. These problems, imineo nobis, they threaten us. We also noted that, uh, we malorum obliviscimur, ob, we forget our genitive problems. So we've seen a direct object in the dative, and we've seen with verbs of remembering and forgetting a direct object in the genitive. We've also seen a Greek accusative, an A where we might have expected an E-M on giton, gitona. So we order giton, who most willingly played the role of the slave, to follow us to the baths. We have noted, again in line one, a relative clause, where we have the relative pronoun, qui, quae, quod, um, coming back uh, um, in a relative clause, a simply descriptive relative clause, one that has a verb in the, uh, in the um, indicative mood. Nothing very complicated there. Again, we'll go through the structure of relative clauses in some detail. And finally, we have encountered in this section a number of um, so-called deponent verbs, verbs which are passive in form but active in meaning. If we go through our text, what we see um, 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 in line four, obliviscor, in line six, sequor, um, these are important, important forms uh, to recognize, to know when you have encountered a, uh, a, a deponent verb as opposed to a truly passive form, like invitati estis, which is from the regular verb invito, meaning to invite. Thanks, and we'll go through this uh, in 